In this video, we're going to finish our lecture nine over spine and pelvic girdle. So um, we need to finish talking about the spine, specifically the injuries that occur most of the time. So primarily the region of the spine that is most commonly injured is the, the lumbar region. So typically from L1 to L5 and even into the sacrum is where we're going to see the majority of our injuries. Um, Next uh, is the thoracic region followed by the cervical. There is an unspecified region that, as you can see, is slightly above what our percentage of thoracic spine injury susceptibility is. Um, but more times than not, that is a general pain or generalized um, tingling and numbness that may be caused um, based on some type of overuse or long-term situation. Low back pain is one of the most common, if not the most common um, complaint in orthopedics along with um, you know, knee injuries or some type of shoulder injury. Uh, potential causes of low back pain are some type of muscle strain from lifting that can cause either spasm or uh, some type of slight tear, distorted posture for long periods of time, which is by and large one of the most common reasons for low back pain, especially in today's society, tight hamstrings or tight IT bands, and then also weak abdominals. Now, most of the time, distorted posture goes hand in hand with weak abdominals because um, weakness in that anterior postural musculature is going to contribute to distortion of posture and the inability for us to tap into that posterior chain and um, improve our, our posture overall, especially over long periods of time. Now we often hear the phrase lift with your legs so that we can protect our back, but we have not really talked about what that means or in your case, well, oh, step one. Um, in our case, what that means for um, even potentially causing some type of back pain. So overall, um, using our legs rather than our back to lift an object is going to reduce the amount of muscular, tor muscular torque that is placed on that low back region. So when we lift with our back, we have the object or the weight further away from our center mass or that axis of rotation, which in this case is going to be our lumbar sacral region. And when we do that, we are increasing what's called the moment arm away from that axis of rotation. When we increase the distance between the axis and that box or that weight, that is going to increase the amount of torque that is placed on the joint and the amount of force that the muscle actually has to contribute for us to move the object overall. But when we have the, the weight or the object closer to our center of mass, we reduce the distance of that moment arm and we can reduce then the amount of muscular torque that is applied and the amount of torque that's placed on the joint um, during that rotation movement. Often we see individuals that have somewhat of a forward lean posture. Um, so when we stand in this forward lean posture, our line of gravity actually passes anterior to the center of our fourth lumbar vertebral body, so our L4. When we do that, it actually creates a forward bending torque, which has to then be counterbalanced by the ligaments and the musculature of our back. Any movement that we might have that affects the line of gravity going either further in front of our um, center of mass or behind it, that is going to uh, affect the magnitude of the, what's called the bending moment. Again, it's the torque of it that is caused. So when we have a slouched posture, we are strictly relying on the ligaments of our posterior chain that to essentially counterbalance that movement, which is then over time, especially going to cause pain and discomfort uh, specifically in that lumbar region. 
So specifically in talking about L3 and the amount of load that is placed on that vertebrae, um, the reason we talk about L3 is it is one of the most commonly injured vertebral bodies um, by and large. So when we talk about load, we can actually quantify it based on our anatomical position. So when we are lying down, that obviously will have the lowest amount of load placed on that L3 body. It, it should be standing when we are standing upright. Now that does, um, it is constituted based on that line of gravity, whether it's going through our center of mass or whether um, that is now forward or behind our base of support. When we are sitting uh, in a chair that does not have any kind of back support, then the load is increased to 140% compared to a normal load. When we are hunched over in a standing position, the load increases to 150% compared to normal load. And then of course, when we're sitting hunched over with no back support, that load for further increases to 180% of what is considered normal load on the L3 body. In discussing specific spine injuries, a herniated disc is one of the most common ones that we see. Uh, this can be a cause of repeated heavy lifting, specifically with poor mechanics, because it does eventually cause a uh, bending load where one side is placed under tension, one side is placed under compression. And what we see is the, um, the nucleus of that vertebral disc typically starts to leak out of, uh, of the surrounding um, structure that would typically hold that nucleus in. So with a herniated disc specifically, the nucleus pulposus actually protrudes between the, the vertebrae. So when this happens, our nerves are likely impinged by that um, nucleus, and that is going to eventually lead to some type of numbness or pain or weakness because the nerve has been influenced or impacted by this, um, this nucleus. Overall, there are six different uh, major disc problems that we see, or five different disc problems that we see. One is a degenerated disc. Now, we can often classify any of these as degenerative uh, disc disease or triple D. Um, and a thinning disc, that one that's fourth on the list there, is going to be a form of degenerated disc as well as um, disc degeneration with the osteophyte formation. A bulging disc and a herniated disc, though, is, is more than likely going to be um, the cause of some type of specific injury, um, or, you know, it can be obviously a caused by something over time. Um, but the thinning and degeneration that can occur um, is actually characteristic of the nucleus not protruding out of that uh, vertebral disc between the, the vertebral bodies. Forward head posture, um, we talked about this a little bit in reference to uh, kyphosis, I believe. So um, this is actually something that is becoming more and more common due to the use of smartphones and laptops and tablets on a continual basis. So what happens uh, when we have this forward head posture, especially over large amounts of time, we can actually see this domino effect based on what's happening at the head. So when we see that the head is moving forward, that actually shifts our center of gravity slightly anterior to our center mass and our base of support. To compensate for that, we're gonna see that the upper body actually drifts backwards slightly, okay? And so then we've got this more exaggerated forward head posture. And then to compensate for the upper body shift, the, we then see that the hips actually tilt forward. 
So instead of having a vertical straight posture line that goes from our pelvis through our vertebrae into our skull, as far as the line of action going through that center of gravity, we now have this zigzag line that is our body's attempt at compensating for um, our head posture that is now anterior to what it should be. Whiplash is another common um, spine injury and it is caused by rapid flexion and extension of um, the cervical region. Most of the time, the uh, injury itself is to the posterior ligaments and it is a strain of that ligaments. When, um, when we speak about whiplash in general, that is a very general term. It doesn't specify the actual injury itself. So most of the time we see that C7 right between uh, either C6 and C7 or C7 and T1, that is when we're going to have that, where we're going to have the, the strain of the posterior ligaments. Lastly, for this lecture, uh, that should actually say trunk muscles. We are going to go over the primary muscles of the trunk that you need to know, as well as the muscle circle that goes along with these, uh, this musculature. Okay, so first, our primary trunk flexors are obviously going to be the rectus abdominis and our internal and external obliques. Next, we've got our primary uh, trunk extensors, which are our erector spinae um, and then our quadratus lumborum, which is obviously going to be much, much deeper than our erector spinae. One of the interesting features of our anterior abdominal uh, musculature is actually the anterior rectus sheath. So this is a fibrous connective tissue that covers over our rectus abdominis right in the center of our abdomen. But that sheath is actually from the aponeurosis or the connective tissue, the fibrous tissue that um, is formed from the internal and external obliques. So in a way, our internal and external obliques provide a further protective um, covering and uh, structural integrity of our um, rectus abdominis. We also have tendinous intersections that are between uh, certain components of our rectus abdominis. This is our transverse tendinous bands. So they subdivide the rectus into three or four muscle bellies. And of course, as you know, this is kind of the that quintessential six pack um, that you might see on someone that has very low body fat. Um, we can actually see where those tendinous intersections go um, transversely across the, the rectus. Our transverse abdominis actually does not have specific movement actions of certain joints. It is deep to the internal oblique, uh, but it does still play a very crucial role, especially in core stability. So it compresses our viscera and our ribs to increase our intra-abdominal pressure. Now our intra-abdominal pressure is really important in protecting our spine when we're doing some type of, um, especially a triple extension lift, whether that's a squat, a deadlift, a clean, a jerk, any kind of Olympic or power lift specifically, um, we want to increase our intra-abdominal pressure as much as possible, breathe through our stomach rather than our chest in order to protect our spine from any type of injury during that heavy lifting. Uh, it also has an important function in breathing. So uh, the movement of our diaphragm and, you know, the expansion of our rib cage and our lungs, and then as well as in straining. So during continence, like certain bowel movements, during pregnancy, especially in females, and then also again in heavy lifting. In general, our trunk musculature are divided into right and left sides. So pertaining to our left lateral and right lateral trunk flexors, our left lateral trunk flexors are going to be the left rectus abdominis, left external and internal obliques, left erectors, and left quadratus lumborum. 
right is again the same muscles just on the right side of our body to produce that right lateral flexion. Last but not least, we have our trunk and lumbar spine um, muscle circle here. So the ones that you primarily need to know are your left and right rectus abdominis on the front center there, our um, right and left internal external obliques, our right and left quadratus lumborum, and then of course our right and left erector spinae. So this is the last slide for this um, lecture. I will post an assignment that I want you all to complete by Monday.